Um, Sads, we, we spoke on the outfield after the Essex game, last game of last season, and I suppose mixed emotions at that time. Obviously delighted at staying in Division 1 for the first time that Northamptonshire managed to do that. Disappointment at just slipping that place down the table and, and losing the last game. Looking back on last year, what are the main lessons that you feel you've learnt about the group, about the way you go about things, the main takeaways from last season? Well, yeah, um, trying to cast my mind back, really. Um, main learnings, I suppose, are how good we are and how good we can be um, and how we can still keep improving. So last year was great. We did, we did really well. There were some fantastic success stories in there. Um, but there's also so much more that we can get. And I think that's probably been the focus of the winter, really, is to try and eke out that little bit more. Um, I think that at our very best, we can beat anybody. And I think if we can close the gap between being at our best and not quite at our best, if we can get that consistency up a little bit, then I think we'll be a real force to reckon with. So, um, yeah, lo loads of learnings. There's uh, learn about myself, learn about the coaches, learn about the players, learn about uh, leaders in the dressing room, lead learn about practice, learn about how we can tweak things a little bit whether it's pre-match prep, whether it's analysis, whether it's uh, debriefing, whether it's kind of resting and recovering, there's always so much to learn. So it'd be difficult to kind of go through everything right here, right now. But yeah, I, uh, I think last year was fantastic, but it's, uh, you know, moving forward now, that kind of counts for not very, not very much as we move forward. So it's about building on that. One obvious change in terms of the Red Bull setup is the leadership team, the on-field leadership team, which has changed. Luke Proctor is now captain. Lewis McManus is vice captain. What sort of qualities do you think they're going to bring at, at the top of the team? Well, they're both winners. They're both fighters. They are uh, phenomenal professional athletes and they're both leaders. They lead by example. So neither of them will ask anybody to do anything that they don't do themselves. Procky is, you know, he is an absolute leader. He is, people will follow him. People already follow him. People look to him for leadership before he was even an official kind of captain or leader in that sense. So, He's a leader by nature through how he goes about his business and everybody is fully behind him. Lewis will be a brilliant foil for him. He's very calm, uh, he's very consistent in what he does day in, day out. He is somebody that has really kind of grown into this group. He, he fitted in so easy from day one a year ago. And it all, you know, it was quite a quick turnaround with him coming. And, you know, he is hugely respected. They both are. They're both hugely respected in that dressing room for for various reasons. So I think they'll make a real good file for each other. Um, and I'm looking forward to working closely with them. It's already been great. Lewis is an interesting one. Um, and it proves, I suppose, the, the vagaries of professional sport and professional cricket in particular. And that this time last year, as you say, came to the club and he wasn't sure at the start of the year whether he's going to be playing first team cricket, obviously down at Hampshire with, with Ben Brown and so on. Came here uh, very early on, you were telling me and anybody else that would listen that you thought he was a leader on the field and off, and I suppose it may be pleased that what happened last year rather bore that out. It did. I mean, he, he came and he, whatever was going on around him, he went about his business and he was the ultra professional. I mean, his body's in immaculate condition. He trains to the nth degree, um, but he's also very, like I say, he's very calm. But he's very logical. He's very, very smart with what he does. If you if you chat to him and pick his brains, he speaks great sense. He's got a brilliant cricket brain. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, those leadership qualities, he's, uh, he, the leadership qualities he's got are, are natural and he'll be a brilliant foil for Brock. Um, you know, in that, in that vice captaincy role, it's a bit of a blend of two roles, really, because you, you have to still be connected and, and with the lads and sometimes be able to pull the lads up or put an arm around their shoulder. But you've also got to be the, the guy who's honest. He has to be the guy who Brocky turns to, whether it's about cricket or something else. So. You know, he has all those qualities in abundance and uh, I know that Procky was very keen to get him as his right-hand man, so good for us that he accepted. But between them, both of them, I think they'll make a brilliant partnership. Let's talk a little bit about recruitment and, and um, just in the, in the last few hours, we've heard about two Australian bowlers coming in, uh, Chris Tremaine for the first three games and then um, Lance Morris for the, for the second three. Just tell us a little bit about those two because they may not be names instantly recognisable to, to a lot of uh, cricket supporters, those that don't follow the... The, the game internationally closely? Well, Chris is a, a bit of a seasoned pro, seasoned campaigner. We feel that early season conditions, he's going to be somebody who bowls a brilliant length for English cricket. Uh, he's going to challenge the stumps. 
He is a real workhorse, but he's also somebody who can, you know, blow a blow, blow team away with his with his performance. Um, he is going to ask questions. He's going to be a brilliant foil for the other bowlers that we've got. And again, he is relishing the chance of getting a, a Duke's ball in his hand. I think he's, I think one of his most successful seasons out in Australia was when it was with a Duke's ball. So I know he's licking his lips, ready to ready to get a go with that. Uh, certainly, if there's any kind of English early season nip around. And then Lance is slightly different. Lance brings a, a bit to our attack that we that we missed last year, that we that we haven't got in raw pace and obviously some bounce with his height. He's somebody who's uh, going to be very different, but the wickets might have dried out a little bit there and hopefully he can bring something to our attack that we haven't got. So between them, we feel those two recruitments are going to be great for us in the first six games. The seamers, uh, if you like, the homegrown seamers have looked pretty impressive in the, in the pre-season warm-up, the matches that we've, that we've seen. Um, Jack White in particular looks in, looks in terrific, Nick, and you know, long may that continue. But what about workload? I mean, this is something we always sort of talk about at the start of, of any season, it's about workload for the seamers. Are you going to be looking to rotate the likes of, of uh, Jack White, Ben Sanderson, Gareth Berg, Tom Taylor, or, or are you going to stick to a, a unit? How's, how's it going to work? How do you see it working? Well, I think there's always injuries and niggles that we have to protect, so we might get a bit of natural rotation anyway. But ultimately, we have to look after those guys best we can. County cricket is a tough, tough slog for anybody. No, none more so than those seamers and those fast bowlers. So we understand how hard it is and we have to protect them. So we'll we'll push them, we'll challenge them as we do everybody, but also we'll, we, you know, we've got a brilliant medical team, Nick Allen, Chris Larkin are fantastic and I trust their opinion on everything. So uh, if they feel that it's a tie, obviously the player has some input as well and nobody knows their body like themselves. So it's... It, we will look to rotate, but we'll also look to try and win every game and pick the best team we can for every game. So it's a, it's a balance of both, rather, I think. There's always a little bit of nervousness as, as the season progresses and you know the players are, are up for contract and are they going to re-sign? What's, how's it going to pan out? You must have been pleased, I would imagine, as a, as a coaching unit, as a, from the club's point of view, that pretty much all of the players that you wanted to keep um, and you wanted to, to sign new deals did so. And I think in particular about Ben Sanderson, to commit himself for another three years is, is terrific. It is. I mean, his record speaks for itself. I don't need to sell Ben Sanderson to anybody because we all know how good he is and how good he's been. He's our most prized asset. So the fact that he stayed, he was almost the one that got everybody else going, I think. The fact that he committed his future here, um, the knock-on effect of him staying was great. And like you say, everybody that we offered a contract to have stayed, which is, which is fantastic and testament to the club, really, that they want to stay and be part of it but yeah I mean look last year was tough in some regards both for, for myself but also for the players because there was so much uncertainty uncertainty brings you know kind of people on edge a little bit whereas this year we've got I think there's only a couple of guys out of contract you know and hopefully we can keep them and get them on the line whatever it might be but uh, it should be a little bit smoother with a bit more uh, it should be a little bit more stable than it was last year so hopefully it should go well. I'm sure you don't want to talk too much about individuals in terms of recruitment, but um, the rumour mill was going over overboard last year about Josh Cobb and thinking, oh, he's going to be moving here or there or everywhere. We, we saw him signing for at least half a dozen different uh, different counties. And again, he proved in the way he batted in the Oxford University game, for example, um, he is a very special player. And it's again, it's very important to keep him pre you know, preliminary, but primarily for, for, the, for the white ball, but potentially for red ball cricket as well, to keep him on board. Absolutely, and, and he was somebody that, uh, Cobb is somebody that was adamant that he still got a lot of red ball cricket left in him, which is great. So it was really important for him to be clear in his mind with that. And he's trained well, he's, he's committed everything uh, all winter. And he showed the other day exactly what he can do. I mean, it, you know, we beat, we beat Oxford pretty comfortably in the end, but if you take Cobb's innings out of there, it might have been a bit closer. So he, he showed what he can do. Uh, you know, consistency is something for Cobby, I suppose, as it is for everybody. That if we can, if we can get a consistent Josh Cobb in our ranks, then uh, we know he can be a match winner for us. So it's again when he stayed and committed his future to the club, it was it was fantastic, both in white ball and, and red ball cricket. And Josh Cobb in red ball cricket, I think, is a, is a very interesting point just to, to dwell on for a moment. Um, I said last year that I really liked him batting at six in red ball. I think it gives it gives the side 
terrific options down there and, and it's the sort of player that against possibly a tiring attack an older ball can just take the, the game away from uh, an opposition side back end of the season for reasons that we, we rehearsed well at the time um, he had to bat up at three what's the thinking this year have you got any any sort of thoughts in mind as to where he might fit in or indeed is he going to fit into red ball for the start well both of those questions really yeah he's uh, he'll, he'll bat wherever he's asked to bat and that's testament to Kobe he'll get his head down and try his best. Um, I think in that kind of middle to late order, he it suits his game a little bit. But again, he will, he'll back wherever's best for the team um, and, and try his best. So, County Championship starting Thursday and, and one of the talking points that we probably just need to spend a bit of time on is the, the change in, in points system. Um, the fact that now there are fewer points available for a draw. It's gone down from eight to five. The bonus points have changed um, and you're actually going to have to score at a reasonable lick to get maximum batting points. To what extent do you think is this um, reflecting a little bit the uh, the whole basball philosophy and, and also the fact that, you know, a lot of people will say, well, look at Northamptonshire last season, they drew a lot of games, they stayed up. Um, how, how do you view the new, uh, new points system? Well, yeah, I mean, as an England fan, as an England spectator, um, then I can understand why they've done it. They're trying to increase the probability of getting fast balls bowling 90 miles an hour and they're trying to increase the probability of playing attacking entertaining cricket scoring at five and over so I can completely understand why they're doing it and part of me likes it um, how we fit it I mean the strategy we had last year worked we kind of said we're going to play this kind of cricket I mean you know we always went out to win the game of course uh, but we did say that you know, we have to prepare our minds to be ready to fight and battle for four days of which we did and the lads were incredible with that. And I think that took its toll towards the back end because, you know, they played more cricket than anybody. They fielded more overs than anybody. Um, but it, it worked for us, you know, it, that strategy worked. And we said all along it would put us, if we play that way, we, it will put us in a position to win games of cricket. And we won two games and we could quite easily have won six. Um, so, you know, it worked for us last year. Will it change too much? We'll wait and see. <laughs> Um, I know that the lads are inspired and want to buy into a bit of, as you call it, buzz ball. Um, but I think it's more the kind of intent to go and play with freedom. I think I love that idea of the lads being able to go and express themselves. Um, we have to play some smart cricket. There'll be times where we have to soak up some pressure. And I think as long as we get that balance right between when to attack and when to just sit in a little bit, then I'm sure that we'll see some some good entertaining cricket where some of our more explosive players will hopefully get take the game on. And that's what we want to do. So... But again, very much down to that individual to to judge the feel of the game and, and play what's in front of them. Because I'm sure a lot of more traditionally minded county championship followers will say, "Well, yeah, okay, that that's that's great," but there is a lot of um, of kudos to be obtained by saving a match, by batting long, showing a bit of spirit. I think of the Yorkshire game here, the Surrey match, perhaps yeah. in big particular here. Um, it's still got to have a place in, in Championship cricket, surely, especially being played over four days. Absolutely. There'll be times where, again, like I've said, we've got to play what's in front of us. We've got to play the conditions. We've got to play the state and the situation of the game. Um, there's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how it unfolds, actually, around all the counties this year because, you know, we're all, we're all excited by what England have done and we all want a part of that. We want to be part of that and play our part in that. But there are times where we're going to have to sit in and soak up some pressure and there'll be times where we can attack. As long as we get that balance right, then I'm sure we'll go all right. We'll, we'll, we'll go well. But I think our first and foremost, our our brief is to try and win every game that we play. You've gone fairly deep into this chat without mentioning David Willey, um, who was obviously one of the headlines of last season when, when the news broke that he was coming back to Northamptonshire from, from Yorkshire. I think it was almost universally greeted with uh, with, with delight by supporters. Um, we know that he's not going to be seen an awful lot in the, in the early part of the season because he's obviously away with, with the IPL. To what extent has he been able to put any any input in, into the squad in, in the relatively small amount of time that he's actually been able to, to be here at Wantage Road? Well, the fact that he's on, uh, he's got a North Ants tracksuit again, and the fact that he's on WhatsApp groups, and the fact that he's been in, not loads, but he's been in a few times, that gives everybody a lift. It gives the whole club a lift. You know, getting a marquee player like that of his stature at, at, at this stage of his career is remarkable, and again, testament to the club of where they're headed and their ambitions that they've got. 
Look, he brings with him a, a level of professionalism, a level of expertise, and a level of skill that you know we are delighted to have back with us. He's got a real deep emotional connection with the club. You know, listening to him talk, he, he talks about when he used to come and watch his old man play, and when he used to be on the on the outfield running around, uh, training uh, during the pathways, coming through the system, and he, and he holds this club very, very close to his heart. And it's it's really kind of exciting to listen to him talk about it. And he's desperate to bring success back to North Ants and play his part along the way. He's a leader. He leads by example. Uh, the input he'll have in the dressing room. We fully respect that he's got a lot of global commitments at the minute, and we fully respect his England commitments. And we fully kind of we're on board with that, and we wish him all the best. Because when we do, what we know is that over a period of time we'll get more from him. Um, he wants to play all formats of cricket <clears throat> at some point when the time's right. Um, but you know we, we'll probably see him first and foremost in the T20 this year when he comes back from IPL, um, and he's he's raring to go. You know he's in touch regularly. I know some of the lads are uh, spending a bit of time chatting to him as well. So he just gives the whole place a lift. So it's great to have him on board. Another uh, likely newcomer in the early part of the season, of course, is, is Hassan Azad, who, who many will be uh, familiar with him when he's playing for up the road at uh, at Leicestershire. Um, again, he's one who's, who's looked perhaps as though he, he might be struggling to get back into the game, went away to the, the South Asian Cricket Academy and now finds himself with, a, with an opportunity to impress. Again, what did you see in him that made you think, yeah, we need him, we want to have him here? Well, I worked very closely with Haas uh, in 2018, 2019, I think it was, in my last couple of years at Leicester. So I know him personally. He's a great man, very humble. Um He's got a, he's got his own method. He's got a strong mind, and he's got a point to prove. And I think that it's, it's a really exciting prospect. He loves the game, and he wants to be part of something, um, and he wants to buy into what we're about. You know, I've got to mention Emilio. It's a shame for Emilio. We really feel for him. You know, having a, a bit of a setback early season. He was in great condition. He was, you know, he was ready to go, ready to fly. He'd worked very hard over the winter to improve his game, as he always does. But sometimes these things come and you know set you back a little bit. He'll come back stronger and he'll be fine. But in the meantime, I felt that was an area that we needed a bit more support, a bit more uh, you know somebody to go and play that role. And Hass has come in and he's, he's taken his opportunity. He's played well and he's, you know I'm looking forward to watching him. So he's a good man. I'm not going to ask you to, to give a date, but um, obviously a lot of people will be thinking, well, how long is Emilio Gay going to be out for? Are we talking about a couple of games? Are we talking about the, possibly the, the first? Um, tranche of championship matches. How, how do you see it unfolding? I know I see actually he's, out, he's been out there having a, a knock even today, just to sort of feel back yeah. on ball. And well, is that is that perhaps the danger that he wants to come back so so soon? It is absolutely the danger. Yeah, it's great to see him out there. Actually, it's the first time he's hit balls. I think it's the first time the physio Nick's let him let him go. We've absolutely we've had to put the reins on him. He's somebody that will outwork somebody else. He'll he'll you know in his head he has to outwork everybody, which is part of the reason he's so good. Um, but the danger from us, from a physical perspective, was that he did too much too soon. So he's had the reins on him, but it looks like the reins have started to come off a little bit. In terms of time, to answer your question, I, I, probably be around the, this six-week block that we felt that we were going to miss him for. Um, if he comes back a little bit sooner, then great, but we don't want to rush him back. We don't want to risk losing him. We don't want to risk getting him back to lose him for longer. So um, he's in the hands of the phys and the medical team at the minute. And... Uh, you know, I'm sure I'll be back. From your point of view as a coach, one of the, the most difficult things is always balancing a side, particularly in Red Bull cricket, and getting that balance right. How much of a help has it been, the fact that Rob Keogh last year batted beautifully, batted consistently, um, and also had his best season for, for Yonks with, with the ball, with his off spin? Does that make balancing the side easier, the fact that you've got Rob there as, as, as two players in one? Element? Absolutely, especially with Proc in there as well. You know, both of them do do both roles. Keyes was great for us. He's a really valuable asset for us. And, you know, getting 30-odd wickets and 800 runs last year. Uh, let's hope he does it again. Um, yes, to answer your question, it gives us freedom to play an extra batter, an extra seamer, an extra spinner if we want. So it kind of gives us that kind of luxury position a little bit lower down the order to balance the team. So Keyes is crucial for us. You know, he's uh, he's ready to go as well again. So he wants to, you know, sign up a good players to back up a good year with another good year. So um, I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll be fine. 
Let's talk a little bit about Ollie Sale as well. Of course, he's joined Northamptonshire this year. Um, having not played a lot of first team cricket uh, at Somerset, again, what sort of roles do you see? Are you looking predominantly as a, as a white ball player? Well, he's signed for all three formats, which is good. He wants to play all three formats, which is which is great. But we again, we just have to respect his body a little bit. He's had a couple of injuries in the past. Um, it's going to be a little. His, his priority at the minute, I suppose, is white ball. That's the preference at the minute. But we are also with the the white ball stuff. We are also building him to be a red ball cricketer a little bit later down the line as well. So. We want him to play all three formats, but we're not going to, again, we're not going to risk him in red ball cricket to break him for, for being up for selection of the white ball stuff. So, again, it's just getting the balance right. Let's just broaden the, the discussion a little bit because you, you touched on this, I think, when you talked about David Willey coming to the club and, and saying it was a, a bit of a statement, if you like, and, and from the club's point of view, to get a player of uh, global mm. uh, profile back to Northamptonshire. Looking around the ground, there's a lot of work going on. Obviously, there's facilities over the far side. I'll be, I'm sure supporters will be interested to know about as I've seen the scaffolding up at the far side of the ground in the new pavilion. Is it a question of statements on the field, statements off the field as well, saying, you know, we are a club that should be looking to stage, or this is a club that should be looking to stage international matches, this, that and the other. How important is it to get the facilities off the field right to reflect on, on what's happening on the field? It's crucial and, you know, some of the stories I hear about where the club were at before my time here, you know, to see where, the, to hear where they were and to see where they are now is remarkable. So credit to Ray, Chief Exec, Gavin, Chairman and, and the board and anybody who makes those bigger decisions further up. Huge kudos to them because, you know, some of the decisions they had to make would have been really tough. But here we are <clears throat> a few years down the line and you know, I think we're in a good, stable position. So the ground, the ground looks amazing. I know the sun shines out, so it always looks better with the sun out, but it looks amazing. The ground staff are out there working. They've been fantastic for us as well. Um, and then the renovation project up there for the change rooms, I know the lads are buzzing to get in there. They're already deciding who's having which locker and what's going on the walls, which is great. It's, you know, it's, it's, another, it's another sign of progression of the club. So uh, it's really important that those things are done right because not only do we want to keep our best players and we want to inspire the next generation, you know, the pathway players, the academy lads, <clears throat> to encourage them to play. But also we want to attract the best players as well. So it's not just kind of keeping our own, it's attracting good players and they're going to want to come and play at good facilities. Uh, so it's important that the club is in, in a good place, of which, which it is. And that again brings me on to another point I was going to ask you, because you talked then about the next generation of players and getting players through the pathway. And of course we've got George Gowler, George Weldon coming on to the on getting their first professional contracts. And if those that are coming up behind can see that there is actually, it's not it's not a glass ceiling, there is actually a way that they can get through the pathway yeah. into the professional squad, it, it's surely going to help top to bottom. Absolutely, you know, getting getting things in place, at, you know, first team level, second team level inspires those academy lads. And I think, you know, it, it trickles further down the system, doesn't it? We want the, the next twelve-year-old David Willey who's walking through to do some pathway and have some trials for the for the pathway teams. We want them to see what it's like further up, so that they get inspired to, you know, to follow and follow suit and be the next David Willey, like I say, or the next Josh Cobb, the next Luke Proctor, whatever it might be. So it's really important to get all that stuff right. And I think as a club at the minute, we are. Really, I feel that the club is really aligned with where it's going and what it wants to do. There's a real sense of togetherness on and off the field. Uh, it's not perfect because nowhere ever is, but you know I think we get a lot of, lot of stuff right, so it's great to be part of. And I know, I mean, last year, for example, you were you were keen to give a couple of even younger players a go in the in the fifty over competition at the end of the season. It's a long way off August, I know, and there's an awful lot can happen between now and then. But um, is that still the thought that? Um, I know Northampton, you as a coach would want Northampton to win as many games as possible, get to the final and, and win the competition. But is that again still going to be, as it has been the last couple of seasons, an opportunity to perhaps have a look at one or two other players? Well, we'll assess that at the time. We One of the learnings you asked me at the start, what our learnings are, one of the learnings we, we feel from last year is that maybe we could have had a bit more attention on the 50 overs because we had a lot of momentum before the 50 overs. We didn't play as well as what we, we'd hoped in the 50 over comp. And actually, we lost a little bit of momentum into that. That last month of the season, uh, you know, in Championship cricket, so that's something we've got to keep an eye on. But it's also a balance, you know. Is it the priority 
probably not. Championship cricket and T20 would be the preference, to, you know, and the priority. However, we've got to respect that comp and we want to we want to try and win it. But it, but if it means one of our senior players needs a rest, then you know we'll have to take that into account as well. So I don't know if I've answered your question there. We're going to try and win the comp, but also there's a balance of making sure we don't burn players out. And again, we, we need to just talk a little bit about the T20 because last season, hugely exciting start to the campaign. Um, full houses here, um, Jimmy Neesham and, and Chris Lynn smacking it to all parts of, of Abington, not just parts of the ground. Um, slightly different this year with, with uh, Chris, Chris Lynn coming back, but AJ Ty coming in as well, the bowler with, a, with a, uh, an international reputation in, in the short forms. Um, You'll be aware that Northamptonshire obviously have only reached the, the knockouts once since winning it in 2016. Is, to, to what extent is that a little bit of a millstone around the neck? Um, well, only if you say it is. I don't know. It's not, certainly not for me. I think, you know, I think the, the style of cricket we played last year in T20 cricket was, was awesome. As you say, packed houses, balls flying everywhere. But it was more kind of the way we fielded, the way we went about, about our business, the prep that we did. The attitude towards doing it a certain way, we played some phenomenal cricket. We really did, and unfortunately, we ran out of a bit of esteem. Potentially, you know, took our eye off the ball a little bit, which is another learning from last year. Um, we want to go one further this year, but again, I'll always say we, we're just trying to build on what we did last year. So, if you look at it from a sense of we didn't qualify, it looks like looks like a real failure in that competition. However, if you look a bit closely, there was some phenomenal performances throughout that and there's some brilliant individual and team performances <clears throat> so we've got to try and build on that and be a bit more consistent that back end of the comp. What you probably don't need is people like me banging on about the history of it but <laughs> um, finally John um, we talked last year when we when we had this chat pre-season about what was then a, a, like a, new, a new coaching team some, some familiar faces but with different responsibilities um, and this year again it's predominantly going to be yourself Chris Little, Ben Smith and, and Graham White. How do you feel that the dynamic between the four of you is working um, and, and how do you feel it's going to perhaps evolve even more in the course of, of the next six months? I, I think it's fantastic. I think, you know, the, the names you've mentioned there are all individually brilliant practitioners. They bring a huge amount of skill and a huge amount of knowledge to, to, their, to, their, to their chosen field, if you like. Um, and the way we interact as a group, you know, we don't agree on everything. We challenge each other behind closed doors. But one thing that I'm quite big on is that we do challenge each other. And then outside of those four doors, we are a united, a united front where we're all on the same page. So Lids working with the bowlers, you know, he's he's going high in the game, is Lids, and he's been brilliant. You know, he a lot of, a lot of Jack White's success is down to Lids. Obviously, Jack deserves credit, but you know, behind the scenes, sometimes the coaches don't get what they deserve. So, Lids has been phenomenal working with him. Um, he gets the balance right between working with the senior players and giving them what they need, but also having a bit more input to what the younger lads have to have to do. He's got some principles that people have bought into, and it's testament to Lids. Smudge is a he, he works harder than anybody else. He throws more balls than anybody else, and I know that the lads have got a huge respect for him. Um, He's able to challenge where it's needed, but he's also able to highly support those lads as well, which is great. And then Whitey, in his first year last year as a second team coach, he's got a bit of a dual role, Whitey, and obviously with him still playing in the T20, it's been a it's been a difficult one for him just to get right. But I feel he's got the balance really well. He's able to kind of flip into match mode when he needs to, when he's when he's with the T20 side. But he's he's been brilliant with the second team. So in terms of, I always feel a second team role is one of the most important in the entire club because you have to deal and connect with every different kind of player, every different kind of mindset really. You've got players in form, players out of form, players in contract, out of contract, senior players, younger players, you've got trialists coming in. Um and he's taken to it like a duck to water. He's been fantastic. So so the four of us look and, and you know, Nick Allen, Chris Larkin, I mentioned them earlier, us as a group of six are are fantastic. I really feel we work well. We challenge each other but we're all good at what we do as well. And then underneath that we've got Carl, a psychologist, got James Maybe, the analyst, we've got Rob, nutritionist. So one of the things we spoke about last year was getting everything in place, getting the structure in place behind the scenes so that these lads can get everything, these lads have got everything they need to go and be the best they can be. Um, again, don't get everything right, but as a group and the, as, a, as a management group and support staff, 
I, I think we do we do a lot really well. So I'm delighted with the team we've got behind the team. Yeah. And we're speaking about, what, 70 hours before the first ball, hopefully, weather permitting, is bowled down at Canterbury. Looking forward to it? I can't wait. Absolutely. You know, the winter can be fantastic because you've got time to switch off, reflect, learn, plan again and, and go again. You can also spend a lot of time with the lads and the contact time you can get is good. A lot of our lads went away to wherever it was, warmer climates and, and played some cricket. Some lads stayed here, so they were able to work on their games with the coaches. And then you get to pre-season, we are fortunate to go to Cape Town, which was fantastic. We were probably a little bit short from Cape Town, there was a couple of days it rained, believe it or not. Um, and then pre-season, when you come back, there's another element of excitement, but nothing beats a build-up to a, a, the first game of the championship season. There's nothing quite like it. Smell the grass being cut, sun's starting to shine, hopefully it warms up a bit. Um, and let's have a good crack.